All right, folks, uh, Charles Booker, he is uh, facing, running against uh, U.S. Senator Rand Paul uh, in November uh, for um, that particular seat. Today, he dropped this ad that got the attention of lots of folks. Check it out. The pain of our past persists to this day. In Kentucky, like many states throughout the South, lynching was a tool of terror. It was used to kill hopes for freedom. It was used to kill my ancestors. Now, in a historic victory for our Commonwealth, I have become the first black Kentuckian to receive the Democratic nomination for U.S. Senate. My opponent, the very person who compared expanded health care to slavery, the person who said he would have opposed the Civil Rights Act, the person who single-handedly blocked an anti-lynching act from being federal law. The choice couldn't be clearer. Do we move forward together, or do we let politicians like Rand Paul forever hold us back and drive us apart? In November, we will choose healing. We will choose Kentucky. Charles Booker joins us right now from Louisville, Kentucky. I'm glad to have you back on the show. Um, th that had to be, uh, we certainly understand what you were doing and why you were doing it, but it certainly uh, was not uh, easy to put a noose around your neck. Absolutely, brother. That was one of the hardest things as someone who appreciates storytelling and the power of creativity. That was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And, um, it was something that fell on my spirit um, in the sense of lifting up the truth of the challenges we face. Uh, but it was hard. And I feel the responsibility to shine that light, even if it means being vulnerable in the heaviest of ways. Um, that was personal for me. Um, Rand Paul stood in the way, uh, choosing not to allow unanimous consent. Uh, and that bill's passage was delayed more than a year because of his obstinance. That's absolutely right. And what I'm trying to lift up in this ad here is really shining a light on who he is. Rand Paul has shown us himself. Uh, he is someone who throws up smoke screens. Um, he has essentially gaslighted the country throughout his career. He is someone who stokes hate and division and racism every chance he gets and then whistles away as we fight amongst ourselves. And just this last week, Rand Paul opposed moving forward with even debate on domestic terrorism legislation following the heinous act in Buffalo where lives were taken away because of the color of their skin. And that very same incident happened here in Kentucky at a Kroger in Louisville. So Rand Paul knows what this pain means, but dismissed it because he said, well, we have interracial marriage now and churches are integrated. He is dangerous. We want to laugh at him. We want to dismiss him. But he is really the arsonist burning down our pursuit of democracy. And I'm calling it out so that we can beat him. The, um, that particular bill there, only one, only one Republican in the House voted for it. Uh, all the Republicans in the U.S. Senate indeed blocked that from moving forward. Uh, there were a lot of people who were complaining that nothing was done after Buffalo. But the reality is it was uh, Congressman Jamal Bowman who advanced that particular bill. Uh, the, a CBC member who put that bill up. The House passed it. So people can't act like, act like that, that, that did not exist. But this is an example of what happens when you have... 50 Republicans in the U.S. Senate, 50 Democrats, and you have two Democrats who don't want to break the filibuster. And what I keep saying to people is that if people stop just whining and complaining or saying what was not being done, uh, that, that if you look at, uh, you know, holding Democratic seats in Georgia, Nevada, New Hampshire, uh, you know, holding those seats uh, and then uh, in Arizona as well, and then looking and expanding the map, uh, potentially, uh, there could be a 55, 45, 57, 43 Democratic advantage in the United States Senate, therefore um, nullifying, if you will, uh, the, uh, the opposition to ending the filibuster by Kristen Sinema and Joe Manchin. That's absolutely right. And that's why I am stressing to our allies across the country, this race is critically important. We need to win races just like this one here in Kentucky. And Roland, I've said quite clearly that this type of race will define whether we are going to continue our pursuit of democracy or not. It's going to help decide the fate. And 
it's not just because Rand Paul is horrific and embarrassing and terrible, but it's because we're running against hate and division at a time when it is really tearing at the fiber of our country. And, you know, I see the opportunity for us to, to realize healing and to do it together across divides from the hood to the hollers, I often say. And so this campaign to me is our chance to stand as family, to call out hate, but to lift a vision that's bigger and getting rid of the filibuster, having an expanded majority will allow us to do so much good right now. So we can't miss this moment and we're not going to. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, you faced off against Amy McGrath in the Democratic primary to face uh, Senator Mitch McConnell. Uh, you came up short. Um, what lessons did you learn from that defeat uh, that you uh, hope not to repeat uh, in November? Well, one of the biggest lessons that I learned at that time, honestly, was that the people of Kentucky already, um, it was a a hypothesis, a, a prayer that I had of faith in Kentucky that if I stood up and spoke the truth in areas where uh, Trump won handily, if I showed up in communities that historically voted Democrat but don't turn out anymore because they think no one cares, that if I do that work, people will respond, and they did. And so the lesson we're taking from that now and what we've done over this past year winning this primary is we've been organizing early. Um, I have over 20,000 volunteers across Kentucky that are organizing on issues, and some of them have had MAGA hats. And because we're leaning in at a time when Democrats have said, there's no chance, and Republicans have said, we got it in the bag, we'll sew up hate, uh, stew hate, and weaponize racism, we are building a new coalition, we're expanding the electorate, and we're proving the doubt is wrong, and we're gonna blow Rand Paul out this year. And I'm asking everyone to go to charlesbooker.org and help us do just that. Um, when you talk about uh, running, obviously you do, you do not have uh, a significant black population in Kentucky in terms of, you know, representing 20, 30 percent of the electorate. Uh, and so what type of coalition are you putting together? And then if we look at the numbers of people who turn out in the primary, uh, not a significant number. And so how are you going to get those disaffected people uh, to turn out? Because that actually could be the margin of victory, uh, getting those people who are sitting on the sidelines. Oh, that's absolutely right. This is about how we turn out support. And the support I'm speaking of is not just Democrats. The issues that I lift up, um, fighting the end generational poverty, making sure that no one has to ration their insulin like I have, that you can turn on the faucet and clean water will come out, that we can be safe in our homes, that no one else's door will be busted down by the agency we pay for to protect and serve us. These issues aren't actually partisan. And so we're building a coalition rooted on our common bonds that really reminds me of the power of the rainbow coalition, you know, and understanding that Kentucky is a state that is nearly 90 percent white. We have to speak to the truths that bring us together, addressing structural racism and lifting up hard realities like this video that we did today um, isn't just about speaking to uh, the black community. It's about speaking to all of us in our collective struggle and our collective responsibility to one another. And so by addressing the issues we're really facing, and speaking boldly and going to places that get ignored and left behind, the forgotten places, we're finding a ready coalition. And this is exactly why Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul are terrified. And we're going to shine a light for the country in this race. And I'm honored to do it. All right, then. Uh, well, Charles Booker, certainly good luck uh, in uh, your efforts. Uh, and again, a very powerful uh, opening ad. Thank you, brother. Welcome you to the launch of the Mass Poor People's Low Wage Assembly and Moral March on Washington, D.C., June 18, 2022. We are a new, unsettling force, and we are powerful. A new, unsettling force, and we are here. We're rising up to demonstrate the compelling power that we, poor and low income people, have to reconstruct society from the bottom up. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. Because we know that there is no scarcity in this land. The only scarcity is the moral will to do what's right. those with sub-minimum wage jobs 
who can't afford sky high rent. People with disabilities are the fastest growing minority group. It's crazy to me that in 2021, it's still legal for workplaces to pay a sub minimum wage to people with disabilities. There are still so much trial and tribulations that we go through as indigenous people. We can't get a decent wage to sustain ourselves, nor can we get adequate housing. Veterans across this nation say enough is enough. We can't pat essential workers on the back on one day and then cut their health care the next day. Health is a political choice. What more do I need to do to prove that my voice is just as valuable as anyone else's? There are still forces in denial that would try to slow walk our transition to a clean economy and a just future for us all. We have an immoral system run by moral people. But together we walk and we walk and we fight. It's time for a change. Reconstruyamos esta gran nación. See, we are people of resilience as we fight these interlocking injustices together. When we work together, mobilize together and rise together, we become a voice for the voiceless and we become an agent of change in a time where great change is needed. We need the third reconstruction to ensure that deaf people, people with disabilities, and all people can have the right to live and to thrive. We know what they are doing, but the question is, what are we going to do? Reconstruction begins when we change our mentality and say it's time for you to get your foot off of my neck. Oh, yeah.